Hi, it's Gene, retired in Mexico, and we ask one question on this channel, if you're new, which is, do they write them and sing them like they used to? Now, a lot of people, young and old, they think the old music is better, but I'm not so sure. And today we're going to do part two of 30 favorite albums from 2006. So thanks for joining me. These don't do as well as the reactions, but they're important to me. And if you're watching, I really appreciate it. So let's get right into it. I'll bring up the spreadsheet here. And again, these are my uh, favorite albums, not the best albums. I'm, I'm not an arbitrator of taste, but this is just what I think are number 20 through 11. Uh, so we're right in the middle of the countdown. And uh, if you hear a little noise in the background, they're shooting off fireworks tonight. They've been shooting them off every night for several days. So it's great. I'm retired here in Mexico. So let's go ahead and bring this up. And um, number 20. And I do want to say, too, if you like what we're doing, hit the like or subscribe button. And also, I always forget to say this, but I'll put a link below. That is the um, Spotify playlist that I do that's highlights because otherwise it would be a 24 hour, well, it'd be a 30 hour list because each CD is a good hour. Anyway, so coming in at number 20 is a country music album. Yeah, I do like country. And um, my parents were very different. Uh, my father was the country music fan and the rockabilly fan, and my mom liked Latin classical show tunes broadway yeah it was a pretty interesting household so anyway this is a band from miami florida uh the mavericks and i do include anthologies and live albums on my list so this is gold the gold series uh double disc cd of the mavericks great great country they're kind of in that sweet spot between commercial and really alternative so it's not quite your uh you know your uh you're not listening to uh, david allen co or 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 someone like that or even waylon jennings but it's not bro country or anything like that either so these guys have made several albums it's terrific stuff way too many songs to mention we're looking at a cd collection that has probably 30 songs but they've had about a half a dozen top 40 hits on country radio and they're just a cut above but they're also very accessible so if you haven't heard the mavericks i i really highly recommend them and coming in at number 19 from atlanta georgia one of my favorite bands and a band i had the great pleasure to see one time is Drive-By Truckers. This is A Blessing and a Curse, which is pretty straight-ahead rock and roll. Uh, not everybody loves this album. Um, All Music only gave this one three and a half stars, but I think it's better than that. And there's three songwriters on the album, which is Patterson Hood, Mike Cooley, and Jason Isbell, who would leave after this album to have a solo career. And actually, I think... From what I understand, I think his solo career has eclipsed Drive-By Truckers in popularity. He he gets a lot of streams, and uh, and I like Jason Isbell, but it's a nice balance of the three singers. They all do anywhere from three to four tracks that they wrote a piece, and and I love this. And you know they do this uh, high IQ Southern rock and. I just love it, and they're fantastic storytellers, So, and the playing is terrific. So, yeah, Ble A Blessing and a Curse by Drive-By Truckers. Now, coming in at number 18 is a posthumous album, and I actually own this one, uh, released after his death. But this is uh, Johnny Cash. Let me monitor my... Yeah, well, let's see. I, I can't really see here. Hopefully you're not getting too much reflection. But this is American 5, 100 Highways. And uh, yeah, this is this really nice um, CD. Let me uh, give you some of those uh, tracks on here. Um, 
track two is a song I first heard by the Blind Boys of Alabama. God's going to cut you down. <laughs> a really great, vicious gospel song. And uh, he does a Gordon Lightfoot cover, uh, does a Bruce Springsteen cover, does uh, Hank Williams on the evening train. I came to believe um, religious, spiritual song, very good. Um, yeah, uh, Four Strong Winds is a um, Ian Tyson of S S Ian and Sylvia, but is probably much better known uh, by Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. And uh, I'm free from the chain gang now. So, yeah, his voice is really feeble, but the authenticity is there. And you really believe Johnny Cash. And also the recording by Rick Rubin is so intimate. Uh, many of these songs are just him and his acoustic guitar. So pretty cool stuff. I mean, I think we all know the Renaissance. So this would have been the one after the album that had Hurt on it. So American Five, A Hundred Highways. Coming in at number 17, just pure coincidence that I have it after Johnny Cash. I have his daughter, Roseanne Cash, who I'm a big fan of, and her album, Black Cadillac. Uh, this is was a pretty well-received album, and I became a fan of hers in 2003, even though her recording career goes back to uh, the 1980s, and, and, and I like that early stuff, but when she married John Leventhal and he became kind of her music director and producer, as a team, I thought they got a lot, lot better. And um, 2003 was Rules of Travel, and then every subsequent album from 2003 on has been really good, really good. Her next album would be covers, but this one is um, uh, some more original material. She's a good songwriter, and it's just um, some of the songs are so, so emotional, and others are pretty, and she's also a, a great storyteller. I really high, highly recommend Roseanne Cash. She's, she grows on you. I mean, when you first listen to her albums, they sound like, you know, okay, like she's okay. But the more you listen to her, the songs really sink in. She's a pretty good lyricist. And uh, so coming in one slot ahead of her father, Roseanne Cash, Black Cadillac. Coming in at number 16 is an album that I used to hate. Oh, my God, did I hate this album. But partly due to you guys who have asked me to react to her and um and, and i did a reaction um i've come around to become a joanna newsome fan and this is probably her best known album spelled y-s but pronounced yes and this seemed to be on everybody's best of list um yeah let's see on uh, Rate Your Music, this was rated the fifth highest album of the year. Uh, Metacritic gave it an 85, Pitchfork a 9.4, All Music 4.5. And this is what I'm going to call demanding and weird, but rewarding. And she does this thing, you know, in the first part one, I talked about an artist named Bonnie Prince Billy. And I think she's in that same kind of wheelhouse, if you will. She she does this uh, music with lyrics that are a throwback, uh, not to classic rock, but to almost medieval and renaissance music. And uh, she is really highly, highly literate. I mean, I, I sometimes have to look up words because <laughs> she uses so many... Um, you know, hundred dollar words, and uh, she, but she's so talented, and she just plays harp, and has that really um, strange high pitched voice. But the more you hang with Joanna Newsom, the more she rewards. And and one of the things I noticed about this was the engineer and the co producer. I I can't think of two dissimilar people. So 
the recording engineer on this album, yes, was uh, Steve Albini. Yeah, and I always think of him for his uh, sort of dry arrangements or dry recordings, I mean. And, you know, he's pretty famous for his recording aesthetic. And then she turned around and uh, co-produced it with Van Dyke Parks. Now, I don't own the Joanna Newsom, but I do have a Best of Van Dyke Parks. And I went ahead and pulled this out so so you could see this. Who is Van Dyke Parks? This is called Idiosyncratic Path, the Best of Van Dyke Parks. Well, he probably more famous in his solo career was famous for his arranging with the Beach Boys, and including one of my favorite Beach Boys songs, Surf's Up. And uh, Van Dyke just really knows how to orchestrate. So he does the string arrangements, she does the harp, and they co-produced it. But I just wanted to bring that up because Van Dyke Parks and Steve Albini, that is really a bizarre combination uh, on paper. But when you listen to the album, it sounds great, and it works. Coming in at number 15, somebody I did a Master Monday on and uh, had the great pleasure to see in concert one time on a double bill with Rufus Wainwright is Joan as Policewoman. This is her debut album called Real Life. And boy, this is just a... This is a really great album. She's got a, a great voice. I love it. It's um, it's vulnerable, but she's got good range and good dynamics. And and she's a unique songwriter. If you haven't heard Joan as Policewoman, her real name is Joan Wasser. And she plays keyboards and violin. And there's some guest artists on here like uh, Anthony... Um, Hegarty, is that his last name, from uh, Anthony and the Johnsons? He's on here, and just good stuff. And I, a lot of electric piano, which I love the sound of electric piano. And my favorite songs on here are the title track, Real Life, which is the first track. Second track, Eternal Flame. Uh, the one I did Master Monday on was The Ride. I Defy You, and the last song is We Don't Own It. And um, if you get the uh, deluxe version, it's got some bonus tracks, including a David Bowie cover. And she did that when I saw her in, in concert. Uh, but this is the back, back of it. And she's just a terrific artist. Now, I found some of her subsequent albums to be a little bit difficult. But uh, this debut is killer. I highly, highly uh, recommend it. I wanted to give you a couple quotes real quick here. One critic called it splendid but slinky. Isn't that cool? Splendid but slinky. And another critic called it uh, pensive but gentle. So those are good descriptions. Coming in number 14, one of my favorite bands of the 21st century, if you include 99, because 99, they put out the soft bulletin. But this is the Flaming Lips from Oklahoma. And uh, At War with the Mystics. So not everyone loved this album. Uh, All Music only gave it three and a half stars. Pitchfork 6.7. But I think it's underrated. And I would make the same comment about this that I made about Beck's The Information on part one. This album is much better than the critical reviews, in in my opinion. Um, terrific, terrific songs. And um, what, I'm trying to think of that. Uh, man, I should have looked it up before I started recording, but I'm trying to think of some of the song titles on there. But anyway, if you um, are familiar with this album, you've you oh, oh the the yeah yeah song that's i think that's the opening track and the best known song on there but um uh, i don't know there's something about this it's uh it's not really a i don't think it's really a concept album um it's sort of medium density it's um not super accessible but it's not super complicated either and it's kind of right in that middle zone 
uh, and, and, it, and it rewards on repeated listenings and the band's playing great. The production's great. I, I like this album. Is it my favorite Flaming Lips? Mm, no, but I think it's right up there with their best work. So at war with the mystics. Number 13 is one of the most difficult albums to listen to and one of the most difficult to rank because it isn't like anything else on this list, but it's the great Scott Walker who started in the 60s as a boy idol with the Walker brothers and then had a solo career where he did, um, how would you call it, almost cabaret. Uh, Bertolt Brecht and, and different kinds of uh, show tunes and cabaret tunes. And then he slowly morphed into his own songwriting and became extremely avant-garde. If you've ever seen the um, movie, uh, if you haven't seen the movie 30th Century Man about Scott Walker, that is a terrific documentary. Highly recommend it. This album is called The Drift. And he had an 11-year gap. So he had made an album in 1995 called Tilt. And then he made The Drift 11 years later. So he was not very prolific. Uh, this is a difficult listening, uh, dif difficult listening. It's disturbing avant-garde, really dark, really dark songs about war and violence and bloodshed and just you know but the uh sonic palette on here is extraordinary and if you're not familiar with scott walker this would not be my recommended introduction to him but if you're a big fan like i am uh this is one of his best albums and it's really really highly rated so people agree with me uh pitchfork nine Point zero, all music, four and a half, Metacritic, 85, Rate Your Music, 30, 33rd best album. So, yeah, really good. Coming in number 12 is an album by one of my favorites, but I always ignored this album because I didn't understand what it was. I mean, I knew it was kind of oddities and outtakes, but I just never bothered to listen to Tom Waits' Orphans Brawlers, Ballers, and Bastards. So it's a triple album. And the reason it's titled that way is he made it thematic. And I'm not always a big fan of that, but it really helps with this album. So CD1 is called Brawlers. So those are kind of um, rockin' tunes. Um, and then disc two is Ballers, which is some ballads. And then Bastards, the third disc, is his really weird stuff. Uh, now, some people would say all of it's weird, but I couldn't believe how good this album was. And a lot of people agree. I mean, Rate Your Music, 18th best album, Pitchfork, 8.4, Metacritic, 92, All Music Guide, 4.5, triple album, a one off, soundtracks, outtakes oddities collaborations so it shouldn't work on paper it should not work uh but they the sequencing on the album is so brilliant that it just flows and it sounds like an album that was deliberately made to be listened to and i love it it's it's one of tom waits better albums and so i'm i'm still getting into it i've only listened to the album two or three times in my life so i'll be transparent about that but every time i listen to it, it just gets better and better all right we're going to finish this up with number 11 and we're going and i mentioned that i do compilations and anthologies so this is a 60s artist um also, I guess uh, the third person on this list that I got to see in concert one time shortly before he died. And that's Roy Orbison. Uh, love Roy Orbison. This is the essential Roy Orbison, a double disc. And disc one covers all his 60s material, all the great songs like Blue Bayou and Pretty Woman and and um, all those uh 
great, great 60s operatic. I mean, what a great singer Roy Orbison was. And then disc two starts with a generous sampling of his um, Mystery Girl album that he did with Jeff Lynne. And that was the tour that I saw. And uh, those are terrific. And then they have a few cuts from the Black and White Night, which was, um, if you've ever seen that movie, it's got Elvis Costello and Amy Lou Harris and Jeff Lynne and Tom Petty and Katie Lang and all these people that uh, showed up to sing and perform with him. And that's terrific. And then uh, the CD sags a little bit at the end. Otherwise, it probably would have made my top 10. The last six or eight tracks on the album are kind of a mixed bag. Um, it's in roughly chronological order, but they kind of jump out of chronological order at the end. So I would say three quarters of this uh, double disc is just fantastic. And then a quarter of it is is okay, but... Here's a guy who had, are you ready for this? I counted the number of top 40 singles he had on the U.S. charts. 22 top 40 singles. That That's pretty extraordinary. I mean, that's not Beatles level, but that's pretty impressive. And uh, he was very prolific, so he did make some bad music. And that's why there's no single album other than maybe mystery girl that's kind of solid all the way through so to get this compilation of his best material is just wonderful so that's it that's number 20 through 11 uh let me know what you think uh i love doing these videos and uh, uh like i say spotify playlist check it out i'll um take selections from these 10 albums and add it to the playlist uh, after I edit this video, and as we say here in Bonita, Mexico, buen dia.